Hi everyone, this is Kim Alia, and welcome to a very special presentation with my very dear friends Franz Vermeulen and Linda Johnston. Uh, I'm going to give a quick introduction to most of, to these two individuals who are uh, one of the, some of the most erudite, knowledgeable, uh, generous homeopathic practitioners and educators in our entire community. And then I'll just mention a few things about uh, some of the books that they have available and a special offer from uh, Synergy Homeopathic. So first of all, Franz Vermeulen basically uh, started as a practitioner of homeopathy, and in 1990 he was appointed the managing director, teacher, and administrator of the School of Homeopathy in Holland. Uh, in 1992 he wrote the Synoptic Materia Medica I, which uh, originally emerged from remedy summaries that he made for students in Holland, Ireland, and Finland. And he followed that up with the seminal work, the Concordant Materia Medica. Now that's uh, available now in a new version called the Concordant Reference, which is a complete revision and uh, really simply a magnificent work. Uh, he also wrote the Synoptic II, the Prisma, uh, and Monera and Fungi, which are the fungi, which are the two books, uh, or actually the, the two uh, subjects which are going to be discussed during tonight's presentation. Uh, Linda Johnston is a medical doctor, and she's been an active member of the homeopathic community worldwide since uh, the inception of her homeopathic practice in 1986. Uh, she started her own private medical practice in 1981, and Linda began her homeopathic training in 1986 and actually began practicing the same year. Uh, Dr. Johnston's main focus has always been her clinical practice of homeopathy, which she continues to this day. She's the author of numerous articles for homeop homeopathic journals. Um, she's the author of the scholarly additions to the homeopathic repertory from Kent's lectures on the homeopathic material medica, an incredible work and contribution to our, our profession. Uh, she's also the author of the popular book for the general public, Everyday Miracles, Homeopathy in Action. And since her debut public lecture in 1987, she's made hundreds of radio, television appearances, in addition to print media interviews, educating the public about homeopathy, and so on and so forth. And I can say from personal experience that uh, these are two of, as I said earlier, two of the most erudite, knowledgeable, personable, generous individuals in the entire homeopathic community. Just want to share one very quick story. Uh, a little while back, I. I taught a, a seminar, a 25-hour course on the history of homeopathy, and uh, I, I knew that uh, Franz was somebody who had extreme knowledge in that area, so I, I decided to send him some of my slides, and he must have spent hours um, making additions and corrections and pointing out, you know, uh, other places where things were not quite accurate and just demonstrated a level of scholarship that was just simply astounding. So we're very fortunate to have on this call tonight uh, these two incredible individuals. I do want to mention uh, uh, the Fungi book uh, is uh, available from Whole Health Now, the Monera book, and also their fantastic work, which I highly recommend. It's actually on sale right now. It's called Plants. It's probably the most beautiful homeopathy book that's ever been created. Uh, it's quite expensive, but it's well worth the price. I mean, it's just an astounding uh, piece of work, both aesthetically and in terms of its content. And it is on sale now. It's regularly $525. It's on sale. We've only got two copies left, so if you're interested in this, you should definitely go to the Whole Health Now website and purchase a copy uh, for $450. And then I wanted to mention also that... Uh, Kent Homeopathics, which is now known as Synergy Homeopathics, the developers of the laboratory and reference work software, I have a special deal available. Uh, you, can, you can purchase this by going to the kenthomeopathic.com website, clicking on the purchase button, and then if you scroll down a little bit here, you'll find the Vermeulen materials. Uh, and here you can see uh, Vermeulen's, Vermeulen's fungi is regularly $75. Vermeulen's Monera is regularly $72. These two are now available, the two of them together, for just $60. Now, uh, you won't see them until you actually add them to the cart, but when you actually add them to the cart, you'll see that instead of having to pay about $147 for these two books, you'll only have to pay $60. Uh, the other three books, um, which are also on sale, are the Prisma, Concordant Reference, and Synoptic Reference, and uh, those are... 10% discounted, and there's a promo code for those, which is WHN10. I'll repeat that again. It's WHN10. Uh, so these are all available. And uh, if you're not a McRepertory 
owner, there is a special sale going on right now, specifically only for radar and ISIS owners. It's called the crossover sale. You get to keep your program, but these are incredible discounts, almost uh, actually over 60% off the regular prices. Uh, if you want more information about that, you can contact us here in California at 707 822 5807. That's 707 822 5807. Okay, so without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and pass it over to my good friends Linda Johnson and Franz Vermeulen. I'll make them the presenters. They're going to present for about maybe 30, 40 minutes, and there will be an opportunity for questions and answers. Uh, at the end of the call, there'll be about 15 to 20 minutes for questions and answers. You can type your questions and answers into the control panel. Uh, you can start doing that whenever you have some uh, something that you'd like to ask. And time permitting, I'll ask as many of those questions as possible. Okay, great. Are My you, turn? Your turn. Go ahead. Um, okay, well, thank you, Kim, for the introduction. Hello, everyone, wherever you are. Kingdoms overlooked or overlooked as kingdom, kingdoms? Haven't we realized that they're outside of the three that we normally uh, mention in homeopathic differential diagnosis? There are two more. Like in the following slide, you can see. Uh, well, uh, there we go. And you see even that on the right side, the unicellular or the monocellular organisms, the bacteria called monera in technical language, is half of all <coughs> non-human species. And the other four kingdoms are on the left side where you can see the fungi is also a rather large slice. How is it possible that we have overlooked them? The reason is, one of the reasons lies with Hahnemann. And I know we we uh, should not speak ill about Hahnemann. I'm not going to do that, but I'm going to make a few remarks about what happened. The fact that we have five kingdoms instead of three may bring us in trouble. First the trouble. First the trouble. There we are. That is, if we cannot distinguish one species from another, or one organism from another, or one remedy from another, there is trouble. Uh, how is it possible that we cannot distinguish? Well, we have to go to aphorism here the next. We have to go to aphorism 110 in Hahnemann, where Hahnemann says, more or less, that certain things cannot be done a priori. That means ahead of speculations. You cannot smell, taste, or look at um, the sources of our remedies, and nor can you do any chemical analysis before you do approving. By this, he has excluded certain ways of finding information and materi medica information about substances. And partly due to this is to the wrong translation of the German word Prüfung. Prüfung has been literally translated as proving, but it is wrong. Prüfung means, on this next, next you will see that. Prüfung means test or experiment. By using the word proving, it became synonymous with something absolute. It proved something. There was demonstration, it was evidence that by itself excluded other possibilities of finding out information. Also, it led to a one-sided interpretation of data according to cause and effect, linear and sequential. So, that's one reason why we have overlooked fungi as a kingdom. Another reason is we have not realized that they are a kingdom on themselves. We have classified them as inferior plants we have not seen any connection between remedy and its source substance. We had the wrong information about fungi, or we had insufficient tests or provings, or we misinterpreted them. So let's have a look. What do we have in the kingdom fungi? We have, I've mentioned in the second line, you see, do, you see a couple of names, those are remedies we have. The ones are underlined, the underlined ones have the correct name. 
all the others the name has been either changed, is wrong, or has been replaced. In Allen's encyclopedia you will find, aside from Agaricinum, nine species of agaricus, which is the A on the left side, and then follows the species name. You will see by looking behind it, none of these are real agaricus. So, that poses the problem, how can we find additional information if we don't have the name right, if we don't know what the organism was, and where are we going to look? How we make kingdoms is by com a comparison of the largest remedies, the type remedies of that kingdom. In the kingdom fungi, that is limited to three of which we have a reasonable information, which are called the ABC, back, which are called the ABC, Agaricus bovista and Claviceps. Claviceps goes under the ridiculous name Cicala, which is a, is a grass called rye, and it shouldn't be called like that. And in addition to find out things about kingdoms, we, can, we have to look at the information about the organisms themselves, which in fungi is mycological. It's called mycology or biological information. So let's have a look. We first make a division in the kingdom, <coughs> like we do in the plant kingdom. We have ferns, we have flowering plants, we have trees, and we have lianas, and so on, and so on. We do the same in the uh, kingdom fungi, and I have some pictures of some representatives of them. On the left side, of course, uh, everyone will know that the fly agaric on the right side, that's bovista, and what sits on top of it is by comparison. It's not a natural extension of the bo of the bovista. It's an, uh, a bolete which is put on top of it so that you can see what the size is. These we have in the microscopic fleshy fungi as members of the Materia Medica. The ones underlined have been introduced through tests or proofungen or provings by the countries that stand behind the name. You see we have five one added over the last time. So it should be possible to have a reasonable, if not a good overview of at least the macroscopic fleshy fungi. That's one section. Another section are molds. On the left side, aspergillus, on the right side, penicillium, but sits on the apple, you know, the greenish spots. These we have in the Materia Medica, or I have them in my fungi book, I have them mentioned, because you may come across any of these molds in the disease history of patients. Of course, Aspergillus, everyone knows, that's the most well-known, in addition to penicillium, and then on, we have a remedy called ringworm, but it's not exactly known which of the two ringworm-causing molds we use for the remedy ringworm. So I put them under two possibilities. Then we have parasitic and endophytic fungi. The left one is Cicale or Claviceps, grows in rye. As you can see, the right one is a grass, and it's usually categorized in the grass family in the plant kingdom, but it's called lolium, but actually it's a fungus which sits inside the plant and inside the seeds, so it ends up in the bread made from the seeds accidentally by uh, including this rye in, the, in rye bread, and hence it is called endophytic, means inside the plant. You cannot see it on the outside. Parasitic endophytic fungi, we have the following. Claviceps, which we call acet, cicali, Cordyceps, that's a parasitic fungus on, uh, on insects and caterpillars. Fusarium, well known outside of homeopathy. Neotiforium, that's the one that sits in lolium, in the grass. And lolium should not be categorized under the, in the grass family, but under the fungi. And we have astilago. Then we have a group called wood inhabiting or bracket fungi. You can see them on the stem 
or and bark of trees, if you're lucky, certain old trees, certain diseased trees, certain dead trees, you can find them all. We have not much there yet, but in the traditional Materia Medica, we have the polyporus at the bottom of the list, but the actual name stands behind it. It's Formitopsis, it's not polyporus anymore. And there are some other members, some of them well known from the medicinal mushroom circles like reishi and shiitake. They're all wood inhabiting bracket fungi. Then we have yeasts or dimorph fungi. Dimorph means they are either a yeast or they are a mold, which you can see on the right side. You see on the left side of the right side, they are budding yeasts. On the right side, you see the threads. These are molds. And these are in the yeast and dimorph fungi categories. Saccharomyces, you see in the name, Myces means mushroom, Saccharum means sugar, sugar mushroom. That's uh, the common baker's yeast in the traditional material medica called Torula. Now, Ustilaco we, uh, we saw before, it is actually both a parasitic and a dimorph fungi that can appear in two forms. Cryptococcus is a recent addition by uh, Jeremy Scher, excellent proving, very interesting. And he says that he has seen many of it in Africa in the treatment of AIDS. Then we have lichens, they're a category of the fungi kingdom, the cooperation of members of two or three kingdoms, usually two, bacteria and fungi. Sometimes bacteria, fungi and protists, like the right one on the right side, which is in homeopathy known as sticta. This is what we have in lichens. The top two are newly proven in England. Sticta is the traditional one. Usna, Usnea has a single line in Amburica and Cetraria, or Iceland moss, should be Iceland lichen, has also a single line. Right, so regarding the fungi, what we need to find out is how they are in nature, how they are in themselves draw certain conclusions from their behavior, their habitat, their, their um, ingredients, their uh, toxins, etc., and um, add that to the materia medica that we have, and that's the possibility how we can come to a decision how to approach them as members of a kingdom. Well, there is not enough time to uh, um, go into that too deeply, so I have to refer you to the text that I wrote on it. I wrote 1,500 pages on fungi and monera together, and it is rather impossible to uh, get through that in 15 minutes. So I've split that all out for the various groups, what their key features should be from a biological point of view in connection to a tox toxicological point of view and a homeopathic point of view. And and in themes. Kingdom Monera, we call nozodes. Well, in the days of Hahnemann, of course, it was, uh, nothing was known about these organisms. Hence, Hahnemann's explanation of syphilis is incomplete, but he couldn't know anything more. So that means that his conclusions about uh, syphilis as a miasm are automatically incomplete as well. We have two kinds of nozodes. We have those made from bacteria, and we have made nozodes made of viruses. Bacterial viruses, we have, uh, sorry, bacterial nozodes, we have 29. I have mentioned a few names there. Baxolinum, of course, is just another tuberculinum. And the viral nozodes are much less, and less is known about the behavior of viruses outside of the disease-causing features. Bacteria, you can draw up a sort of thematic overview of their biology. For instance, we find this here under Allen. We need to realize there are no tests or experiments or provings or hardly any done with any of the nozodes, despite what Kent says. He is wrong about tuberculinum. He is wrong. So read what H.G. Allen, one of the promoters of nozodes, said about it. To uh, notice the underlined word, to approving 
of anthracyne must be added all the symptoms of uncomplicated splenic fever to those of hydrophobinum, the symptoms of every case of pure hydrophobia, and to those of syphilinum, all those of pure syphilis, etc., etc. In other words, the, the, the nosote materia medica is a reflection of the disease. And Samuel Swan, the man of Medorinum and the man of Civilinum, is saying the following, more or less the same, look how in these days they got away with using the word proving. Just by using the word proving, they got away with including certain materials that this a little bit critical view would, should not have been included. This I found in Christopher Wills about yellow fever, an involuntary experiment on a very large scale. In other words, it suggests that by looking at the disease and its features and who it hits and when its habitat and so on, you can come to certain conclusions as if infectious diseases are like individuals, which Simser says. And then finally, illnesses have their personalities in much the same way as nationalities and historic periods. Impossible to define, but once experienced instantly recognizable. The hope of the tuberculosis has always been of a particular kind. Well, it's very difficult to, to go over these incredibly fascinating uh, kingdoms in such a short time, but I think that starts giving you a launching pad and hopefully we've picked your curiosity so that you will be interested in looking at these more thoroughly. The more you get into them, the more fascinating they are. Now I'm going to present one case here, and um, this uh, case was uh, from 2007, and it's a, a young man in his 20s, and I've shortened it for, for time's sake, but I have retained uh, some of the flavor of what he said, and I've also not rearranged the order in which he said it. So he, he basically comes and says, my mouth and teeth are having problems. My teeth have always screwed me over. They're naturally bad. I've had so much dentistry done, they so easily succumb to cavity. They're not good teeth at all. They're brittle and weak. And pressure, I put pressure on them and then they hurt. In fact, I've had four root canals and a crown and the crown even broke. I get really scared when they hurt. It's just brutal. I can't even brush lately. I think the way I think that if this were tr if I lived a long time ago I would be dead. I mean before they had toothbrushes, you know, a thousand years ago, people died from tooth infection. A lot of people died of teeth problems at a very young age. I had a bad fever at, when I was young when my teeth were coming in and by age 9 I had a root canal. My teeth suck. Five days ago, well, it started happening again that my leg cramps and toe cramps were there. I, I used to have them before and they've come back. I've never seen anybody else have anything like this. The toe pulls down and it hurts really bad. It's so painful. It just screws me over. When I do anything like active sports, I, I just can't play because this happens to my foot. It really sucks. No one else I know ever gets this. It's usually at night. It started when I was in seventh grade. That's when I first became aware of it. It's really bad, but I'm kind of used to it. I also get acne, and that's really bad. I mean, it's really terrible. It's not a, it's, my face is a little bit okay now, but it's on my back. It's so gross. I have really weird skin. I have eczema. It went away, but now it's back again. But, you know, I'm kind of used to it. It causes itching, and then when I itch, the, le the place gets better. It's kind of like a plague. It's just screwing yourself all over. If it starts and I accidentally scratch it, then it gets bigger. It's just better if you ignore it. It gets worse and worse, and it just spreads like a plague. I mean, it is a plague. I don't know what it is. It just sucks. A while ago, my kidneys were hurting me, and I was smoking cigarettes a lot of the time. Do cigarettes affect the kidney? 
I mean, sometimes when I smoke, I breathe, and I can just feel this in my chest. I feel it, and it's hard to breathe. It's a really bad thing. I, I felt like I should give up smoking. I mean, I feel my heart hurt. It's the same pain on the right side, so I guess it must be my lungs. Hearts aren't supposed to hurt, are they? I guess I just don't have good lungs either. It used to be scary for me at the time. Will I have a heart attack? I mean, it's so scary. Will I have a heart attack at the age of 18? It's scary because I didn't know what it was. Maybe people would think I was crazy or that I was all messed up. Once I thought God was talking to me, and I would end up with thinking about really crazy things. I, I mean, I don't hallucinate or anything like that. It's just I had these thoughts put in my head. I know it sounds crazy, but I just, I just hate child molesters and rapists. I just was thinking about that I wanted to kill them. I just hate them so much. I mean, for a long time, I didn't believe in God. And people, I just felt like people use God to explain stuff when they didn't know what it was. They made those things up, but, you know, I'm a really deep thinker, and now I believe in God. So I had a dream, a really vivid dream. It was about counter-strikes. There were these terrorists and then counter-terrorists. They would go around and kill people, and some of the others had to rescue people, and some people got blown up, blow up. I just love this dream. I mean, I was all dressed up in this ninja gear. I was the leader of the squad. It was just... This angel came down and I was talking to him and these other people came storming in. Once they stormed in, you had to go one of two ways, either the left or the right, just like a video game. I mean, I love the ninjas. I just had to hop out of a window and I got in there. I was the leader, but even though I didn't know what was going on. I think we were fighting against the child molesters and rescuing kids. The bad guy, we, we just wanted to kill those bad guys, those molesters. It was just a really loud dream and confused. This guy came in and was running around, and I shot him, and he died. I, I don't really remember anything else, but it was really a sweet dream. I mean, I love those ninjas. They're cool. They have stealth. It's this whole thing about a ninjas. It's, ninjas are just an analogy for what's best. They're cool. They're kind of like vigilantes. They just go out and get things done. There's gangs that kill each other. But they do it to be king of the gang. They fight each other. They hire people to kill other people. Those aren't for good causes. Ninjas are cool. They're vigilantes, but they, they justify themselves. I mean, even if you have to kill a guy, it's to save kids. I mean, the end justifies the means. No matter how much extreme, it doesn't matter, because I just hate those child molesters so much. And rapists, too. I just want to kill those people. I would have killed them. I mean, really hurt them. I would do the most terrible thing you could do. I would just have them live the rest of their life in that terrible way. Rapists and molesters are just the same thing. Whoever they come in contact with, they mess up their life. And then life is hard enough without having to be subjected to that. It's lucky for me that nothing like that ever happened to me. But nonetheless, I really hate these guys. So I get other dreams. Some dreams I run away. Other dreams I get caught. One dream I wanted to run away so badly. I was running away, and in order to get away, I, I climbed down this sewer hole, like a manhole, into the sewer that was in the underground water. I was scuba diving down there because it was the only way I could get away. No one could find me. I got up, and the water was flowing, and, and I was swimming through it. There were some other guys that came down there and were swimming, but uh, I, I just got away when I did that. It felt so good to escape. Before I escaped, I felt in prison, and I didn't want to be. I hated it. I had to escape. Well, I don't really care about all those things. I mean, they're not real. They're just a dream. I thought if it was real, I, I would be scared. People would think you were crazy. But nonetheless, it's really good to kill those people, those evil people. I'm not possessed by these evil thoughts. It, these Killing these guys would just matched up with my morals. I didn't want to kill people, but it was okay to kill them. It's to stop evil and to help society. I was okay with it. Killing bad people, no problem. 
Because, see, I just saw those people as a concept. They weren't real people. They were like an evil force. I could have turned, but I could have turned into one. If I ended up like that, I would hate myself. If I, all of us, any of us could have turned into that. I would have hated it most if I turned into somebody like that, the kind of people that I hate. We all have the power to choose, any of us. But I'm afraid that it might come to the point that I would turn into that and I wouldn't have any choice. It would be like a corruption. The whole thing about killing, it's a terrible thing. Even torturing is even more terrible. I would rather die than be tortured and disfigured. The whole thing. Everybody lives a messed up life. They just do the best they can, but they commit crime. And then those people that, that commit crime and then the people that are their victim, they grow up and they commit crimes. And then it just spreads and it spreads like a disease. It just spreads like that. It's all contagious. It just spreads like a black death. And that's the end of the case. So one of the things I, uh, what I did in this case is I gave him Yersinia pestis, which is the bacteria that caused the black death. Now it wasn't just simply that he named the disease at the end. It was that the whole way that he talked, the whole tenor of the case was about death and killing and, and horrible things happening. But the real key was at the very end when he described this kind of criminal activity as something that was contagious. It, would ha it could happen to him even without a choice. He didn't want to turn into that kind of person, but it, it could happen that these kind of crimes perpetrated on people ruin people's lives and then when they grow up they commit the same kind of crimes. So this idea of contagion and death and killing and killing in such a horrible way all related to this idea of contagion and that's what made me think of the bacterial kingdom. Another thing that was quite telling was the dream he had about climbing down into the sewer hole and, and going into the water because of course that's where the rats live. That was exactly how, uh, how the rats that carry the fleas that have the uh, Yersinia in them that per perpetuates the Black Death. So it was that dream in particular also brought up the connection. So one of the things that's important to re bring these, uh, these ki this kingdom the Monera and the bacterial virus kingdom into your mind is thinking of it in terms of contagion. But we have to be flexible in the idea of what we regard as contagion. So it, he, for him, it's spreading like a disease, the contagion of the criminality. It spreads. The other thing that I wanted to point out from the very beginning is he said, when he said he couldn't brush his teeth and if he had lived a thousand years ago, he would be dead because people died of infections at a young age. So I, that, that placed it back in a time when contagion really was fatal and, and that was one of the first clues that made me think of that period of time and that that was when these kind of bacteria were much more active than today. So I gave him Yersinia and that was in uh, 2007 and he got remarkably better. The whole, this whole dark side of the killing and the ninja and the, the hating these molesters and rapists and that whole element of his personality calmed down and within about six months he had a whole different view on life. He wasn't so obsessed with this darkness and the, the, the killing and the contagion and the infections and his whole language and his whole demeanor was much lighter and that continued up until this present day. So do you want to, uh, we have a couple of pictures uh, to, sh to show you. Oops. Okay. okay, here is a picture of uh, a, a woodcut from that era about the Black Death and here is another picture that really exemplifies the horror that uh, was perpetrated in those days by Yersinia pestis. So, Kim, do you uh, think it, we might be able to open it up to some questions for either one of us sure. concerning anything? 
with the Monera or the um, fungi kingdoms. Sure. I, I actually have a, a quick question for you guys. Could you sure. just maybe summarize um, in terms of the, both the fungi and the Monera, which you would uh, identify as the common themes that you would expect to see for each of those two groupings. And also, I'm curious with regard to some of the subgroupings that, that Franz was describing, if you discovered some themes for the subgroupings as well. Well, for the fungi, of course, we, uh, we uh, first need to look at the group as such, the kingdom as such, so what would fit them all, and then we would have to subdivide it later. Well, there's a certain technique that we can use right away. We can go for the type species and we can consider the type species to contain information for the group as such. So by um, repertorizing agaricus, we could think, oh, that's the type species of the fungi in general, the microscopic fungi. That's one way how to do it. But if we would look at the fungi as such, their biological demeanor, their behavior, for certain things, invasion, penetration, expansion, extension because they most of uh, fungi you don't see they are in, uh, invisible because they penetrate through the tiniest cracks with their mycelia which are spider-like web-like threads that extend the fungi into an for instance a mushroom circle as we sometimes see them in the forest and they grow out of the tips of their penetration. So that would be a point. Then a second is a fungus is more like an animal than a plant because a plant makes its own food and a fungi has to get it from outside himself, can't make it himself. So he eats like an animal out of doors, so to speak. No, all fungi need carbons. Some of them need very uh, simple carbons like sucrose or fructose and others need very complicated carbons that we as humans can't digest like lignin or cellulose. So there might be something with the carbohydrate metabolism or with desire for carbohydrates in general or sugars. And then there is a link to light and um, fungi uh, usually turn away from the light because their their uh, flowering part, if I may call it like that, is on the underside and not exposed to light. They are not dependent on light. They have no light sensitivity in that sense that they need a certain period of light to uh, produce their spores. So there is then uh, they have no commitment actually. They are opportunistic. They can grow in all kinds of circumstances and they don't really commit to certain parts. A, a plant needs to make leaves, needs to make stems, needs to make this, and uh, needs to make that. A fungus not. A fungus is actually just a blown up water containing form. That's it. There are no specialized organs in a fungus. And then finally, fungi have the ability to metabolize toxins, and the particularly heavy metals. Uh, could differentiate that all inside the the subgroups, but that might take a little bit longer. That that it's I, probably in the book. Yeah, the, 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 so the, let me just since you you mentioned that, and you're right. I mean, it's too much to to uh, basically go through all of this on the call. I'm going to just make myself the presenter for just one second, and then again, please write in your questions. And I will uh, field those questions, and I will relay them verbally to Franz and Linda, and then they will respond uh, verbally. So I'm just going to make myself the presenter for a second. I did want to mention that both the Monera and the Fungi book are available on sale. And you can purchase them through, uh, you can go to the Kent Homeopathic. It's a Synergy Homeopathic, but it's under kenthomeopathic.com website, you click on the purchase button, and then if you scroll down that page, you'll see all of the various Vermeulen books. And you can see here, Vermeulen's Fungi is regularly $75, Vermeulen's Monera is regularly $72. That's even less than the actual printed book, and they're now available through the end of uh, the end of the month uh, for $60 for both of them. 
and then also the other three books listed here, Prisma, Concordant Reference, and Synoptic Reference, are all available uh, with a 10% discount, and you need a, a code for those, which is WHN10. And again, for those of you who weren't on at the beginning of the call, if you don't have McRepertory Reference Works, but you do have another software program, you can purchase McRepertory and RefaceWorks at a very special price through the end of the month. We've got what we call a crossover sale. You can keep your own existing program, but you can buy McRepertory and RefaceWorks for over 60% off the regular price. So um, just wanted to mention that. And let me go ahead and feel some other... Uh, uh, Kim, yeah. Kim, the advantage of the electronic form is that you can do a word search through the whole text. Absolutely. Which in, in book form is much more difficult. Because how are you going to look for expansion, for instance, or exploration, or opportunistic? How are you going to find that in an ordinary Materia Medica that you have to read from the from cover to cover? Absolutely. But if you can do a word for it, it's much more easy to get that, a feeling of the particular themes of a kingdom. Yeah, I would say I would say, Franz, that your books lend themselves particularly well to computerization because they've got so right. so much information in them, and how do you retrieve that information? Uh, so especially with um, you, especially with your work, impossible. You cannot even make an index containing it all. No, it's impossible. I, I agree. Yeah. I agree. Um, there is one question here from one of the um, participants. They asked uh, Linda what what potency you used for the patient's uh, case that you described. Uh, the potency I used was 200, and the the reason I chose 200 is because the patient was just describing these things flat out. He wasn't denying anything. He wasn't saying, "Oh, I really don't like to kill people, but in my dreams I'm going to kill them." He he was just saying it right out. It was part of his reality. So he wasn't actually killing people. So that would have been a 30 C, and I would have been visiting him in jail. But he, the 200 is someone who really just describes their state in a very basic way, without the denial, without having to suppress it. And it was he, he very easily spoke these things. So that was why, uh, and I never never moved from that. He had the 200 all these years. You, you did repeat the 200 uh, periodically? Yes, I would say the first year he probably had it about every four to six weeks. And then after about three or four years, well, about year two or three it was more like every three or four months and then now he probably needs a dose about every eight months okay great there's a comment here it says uh it's from one of the participants they say it looks like a picture of ebola deaths and i guess every well again it, it it's not so much uh the um the diagnosis because you could have an ebola person who could be a pulsatilla you know, it's really the the state inside this man. Now, this man didn't have any disease that was uh, uh, mortal. He didn't have any fatal disease. He didn't have even a. He had some dental problems and some acne. So from the you you say well from the death of the de the black death was so serious and so quick and so fatal, but it was his inner state, the inner state was living in that kind of life and that's why I think his words were so important because to him he lived in a world that was of contagion and child molesters and death and killing and that's the world he lived in he just didn't exhibit it in on a physical level as the the kind of black death people died from in in 1300 years ago so Ebola if you had a patient with Ebola, there would be the physical manifestations, but you'd also have to find the state of the person. And that the state of many of these people who got Ebola uh, were uh, humanitarian helpers who were out there self-sacrificing, helping other people. So I think it's important not just to look at the name and the severity of the disease itself, but look at that inner state of the person. What is the inner world they're living in? And that's going to give you a much more accurate prescription and a, uh, a prescription that's going to be thorough and deep. Great. Uh, another participant asked, uh, where, where did you get the remedies? Uh, the Yersinia, I can't remember I off the remedia, but I think, uh, I think I have it from Helios, but I'm pretty sure that's that... That's called Pestinum. Pe Pestinum. Pestinum. 
uh, or a Freeman's Pharmacy also has it. So it was not hard to get. Great. Okay, here's another question. Uh, somebody asks, what are the characteristic symptoms of streptococcus? I'll turn that one over to Franz. Well, actually, I wouldn't know that so quickly. I have to look it up. The characteristic symptoms of streptococcus as a remedy or, or as a disease? Well, I, I, I'm imagining that as a remedy is what they're asking. Well, it comes from the English. I think it comes from Fubister, the one from Cartagenosin. No, David Riley did the proving. And uh, clinical observations from Fubister for all kind of uh, inflammations and, and uh, boils and that kind of things that streptococcus naturally is related to. And um, in terms of the proving symptoms, I wouldn't know so quickly what really stands out there. No, I, I've had several other cases of uh, bacterial and viral nosodes. I've had uh, 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 Lyme's disease and, and uh, uh, Bordelia and uh, also a rhinovirus. And what, what I could say that unites them which is part of the kingdom itself, the theme of the kingdom, really is this idea of microorganisms. Uh, several, several of the patients just felt like small things would attack them or there was a small invisible kind of attacking. Uh, whether it came out in their dreams like that or whether they actually spoke like that. So that, that was a theme. And then again, this idea of contagion, it will come up in just some odd ways, like this fellow th talked about criminality as being contagion. So you have to kind of cock your ear and be listening a little bit in, 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 outside the box to hear the way a patient will describe it, to look at the theme. It's something small that attacks something big. It's something invisible. Uh, one other patient I had who, who needed a, a, a remedy from this Kingdom talked about uh, not wanting to use plastic bottles because the water in the plastic bottles would leach out chemicals from the plastic, and then it would then sh they would uh, it poison her. But it was that idea of these small chemicals that you couldn't see would be inside this water that looked okay, but they were sort of hiding in there, and then they they could be toxic to her. So it wasn't just looking for dioxin or looking for plastic or chemicals that were poisonous. It was this idea of something small and invisible being able to attack her. So ex get to the themes of the very what makes this kingdom special and unique is the small size, the rapid multiplication, the fear we have of them. The, the, and these kind of themes that are part of their life cycle are going to show up in a variety of ways. We need to realize that what we have in nosodes is mostly traditional. And the traditional idea was that disease was the nosode. Or the picture of the nosode was the disease, however you want to see it. So it was common in these days that tubercul uh, tu tubercular um, complaints were treated with tubercolinum because it was believed that when it was prepared in a homeopathic way it would act homeopathically on the disease itself. So under streptococcus uh, we find from Fubister we may consider the prescription of streptococcin in chronic disease where there is a history of acute streptococcal infection very probably including severe infection in the mother during his, uh, during pregnancy and so on and so on. So it's related. So what Linda says, for modern views that we are uh, in the process of developing, of looking beyond the disease process itself as a reason for prescribing a nosodes, because for that reason it wouldn't have its own kingdom. Would you? How would you call that? Interesting. Okay, so there's a, another question here uh, from one of the participants. They, they write, uh, I've been told that bowel nosodes are used adjunctively, not really as a first line, uh, for perhaps as a first remedy. What do you think? Well, that doesn't make it right. 
Well, I, I think bow nozos are something that you use not routinely, like to open a case or in certain situations. Bow nozos have their own specific kind of usage, like any single remedy. And I would just say we have to do exactly what we do in any other case. You take you take a good case and you fought and you prescribe bowel nozode if it's indicated by the symptoms matching by, based on the totality of symptoms by the law of similars. Now I do know that there are some people who use them in a special category who give them under certain circumstances more allopathically and but I would say that you should if you do that recognize that's not really homeopathy that's using something in a, in a different way than what we're used to. Just like if someone gave streptococcus remedy as a nose out for somebody who had frequent strep throats. That's not homeopathic. That's allopathic. So the, the really best results are when you look at this remedy as it in, in as Hahnemann says, you find out what's curative in the remedy and find out what's wrong with the patient and then you match that by the law of similar. So to assume that, because what I hear in this is that vowel nose oats would open up the bowel, so to speak, to use it, uh, uh, use crude language as a sort of laxative. Well, I can't really see any reason for it because they are called bowel nose oats. Does it mean that they will work on the bowel? So if we would have lung nose oats, would they work on the lung? That, that's the wrong way of reasoning. We have to look at what symptoms they either produce or cure and for that we need to go to Patterson and the Patterson's man and wife produce the bowel nose out pictures on the basis of clinical observations. There are no provings or hardly any provings. It's all clinical observations and out of these clinical observations we try to find those that are most subjective, personal and individual instead of the crude pathological type of symptoms that you no doubt could use there as well. Then the second is, how sure can we be about their accurate identity? We speak about the 1910-1920s when these were um, cultured on these petri dishes which had certain uh, feeding substances to bring out certain organisms and on the basis of that, the diagnosis of which particular bacteria that was. That was in these days not, not really so accurate as, as it is nowadays. Hence, we have some confusion about certain bowel nozos. What is psychotic compound? Which one is that? Actually, no one knows really for sure what it is. What is Morgan pure? What is the other Morgan? There are two Morgans. Are they the same? So there are questions about bowel nose oats, not about their use, but about their background. And therefore, the prescribing of the bowel nose oats must rely on the symptoms that have been observed. And we, as a source of getting the bowel nose oats, we must get those by which these observations were made. Now, I think one thing we need to keep in mind, it's true of all kingdoms, but especially the Monera and the Fungi Kingdom is we have information from an era gone by where there was the whole idea of these plants and or these um, fungi and this Monera plants and infection was totally different than ours. So we can't just take a little bit of that information and combine it with our modern information and expect to make any sense of this. We have to. We accept the fact that now we can identify these things. We can, we can sequence the DNA. We can look at the proteins. We can identify individual microorganisms. We know how they behave instead of the the more broad strokes of the past. And the broad strokes of the past weren't limited just to the identity of these things, the fungi and the monera and the different microorganisms. But it was a whole different way of looking at infections, of looking at pestilence, looking at epidemics. Before 1930s it was, or 1830s, it was an entirely different whole mindset. So this is important to keep in mind that there is a separation. And we want to keep our updated information because we have classifications that are more accurate. We have information that's more accurate. 
and we have a way of applying that in a more accurate way. In other words, the things that Hahnemann told us not to do, we should do. These are essential that we do these things to find out more than what can be learned by proofungen or tests. And there is much more to find out when we just are strict and as Linda says, we know now so many things more that we could use to our advantage instead of this blind phase going on in a method that's not sufficient to find out things the way we need to find them out. Well, in conclusion, I want to say that these are two extremely exciting, fascinating, wonderful uh, kingdoms. It's, it's just so interesting to see how, how a patient will talk about uh, the various microorganisms or the, the concept like this case of the Yersinia. What, what was going on in this person who's really in that state? We, the, the Black Death we think of as something in the Middle Ages historically, but we, it's alive and well today as far as what we can give to patients. So you need to really expand your horizons, look at these kingdoms with some enthusiasm, learn about them, and you, your prescribing will be much more accurate, and I think you'll be having a lot of fun with these kingdoms. I think we have time for one more question, uh, Franz and Linda. Sure. Yes. So, uh, so we have somebody who asked. I'm sorry, we're not going to get to everybody's questions here. There's a lot of questions, but we just don't have the time. But perhaps Franz and Linda will be generous and come back some future time and do another one of the sessions. We'd be happy to. Okay. So anyway, the question is, uh, do we have? And he wrote uh, the German word proofing for these remedies, since the organisms usually live. Uh, so that's the first part. Then the second part of the question is, since these organisms usually live on or in other organisms traditionally, must we test these substances individually, or is it better to test them on the organisms on which they live in symbiosis? Very good question. Well, if, it be, if the question is about the nosodes, of course, in the old days, uh, these organisms, these causative organisms, which we know now are bacteria, were not isolated. So they were including all the secondary um, defense chemicals by the organism, they were all included in it. So if you take sputum for a tuberculous person who has a tuberculous cough, yeah, you will have a whole mixed bag of bacteria and just the tubercle bacille. So yeah, this, this is a very good question. And I even believe that pharmacies struggle with that. How should they make a nose out? Should they isolate the organism from a petri dish and then grind it up? Or should they have a an, an, um, secretion including it? Well, then you're going to have white cells, you're going to have bradykinins, histamines, a whole a cornucopia of immune and inflammatory reactions. So you, it's not that you shouldn't do it one way or another, but they should be identified as which way it's being done because clearly there would be a different kind of remedy from each one. If that was the question about the nose oats or was another category included in the question? That was, that was it. Uh -huh. Well, we want to thank you, Kim, for uh, asking us to be here and talking oh, about I want to thank you. our favorite kingdoms. Oh, thank you. Uh, I want to just, first of all, I want to apologize to everybody. There are literally hundreds of, I mean, we've got uh, about <laughs> 260 people on the call, and there's hundreds and hundreds of questions here. Uh, so we're not going to get to all those questions, but uh, so sorry about that. But I think Franz and Linda said they would join us again. And again, there's a great opportunity now to purchase both the uh, Monera and the Fungi books in McRepertory and Reference Works. Normally, this would be $147. You can get it for $60. Bucks. Uh, you do need to have a copy of McRepertory and Reference Works. If you want more information about that or you want to take advantage of the special pricing on the crossover sale, uh, you can give me a call here in California. The number again is 707-822-5807. That's 707-822-5807. And Franz and Lynn, I want to thank you again for, for taking the time out of your very busy schedules to join us. It's always a great pleasure, and I wish everybody a very good evening. Thank you to all. No trouble. Thank you. Thank Bye, you. everybody. Bye. Bye.